How does he not close his own door? A large table with two huge vacuum insulated thermal coffee dispensers. Someone has forgotten a small plastic card next to the stacks of cups. Pair into a discarded coffee cup. Okay. You see nothing exceptional. It's a dirty cup, smudged brown, with old ground coffee stuck to the bottom. Slowly getting moldy. What am I supposed to see here? Look closer. If you squint your eyes enough, the coffee grounds almost seem to make up two letters, F and K. It's a clue. About what? A clue about the person behind all the murders. Yes, of course. It's certainly not just an example of pareidolia, noticing patterns in noise. Worth it. <laughs> it's meaningful, I swear. You just wait. I've got the case nearly busted wide open. Okay, thanks. So, I somehow doubt old coffee is how the police solve investigations. You would be correct. <laughs> Pick up the card? You snatch up the red plastic card. Oh. It features a black contour of a crane lifting a container. The name, Etienne Ogart, is written in the middle. Below it, in smaller text, member of the board. It comes with a magnetic strip meant to open electronic doors. That might come in handy. That might be very, very, very nice. Stair made of pallets leading up. We had a thought here. Where'd it go? There was a thought. When we were coming in, there was a thought. All right, well, it's gone now. Why, why would you just leave your office open like this? Taxidermy fish that tells time. I don't know what just happened. I think I leveled. Desk has been cleaned out for the night. Can we go back here? No. Can't. Smart man doesn't leave any incriminating documents behind. So he cleaned everything, basically. But we got a card, so that's something. I don't have that thought, whatever the heck it was. Is he gone? Nope, he's still here. Okay. Well, we know how to get to him now, which is good. Well, although, well, we have the card. So maybe the card will let us get back without jumping, which would be really nice. Now, can I zoom out? Okay, cool. Like, I can't see. This crane is supposedly empty. So let's see what happens. A rusting control marsh. On. Let's press marsh. With a loud grind, the crane shifts overhead, moving a massive metal container through the air. Okay. That looks bad. 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 Is it okay? And with a surprisingly quiet thunk, the crane places the container down. This crane was built with a purpose, which has now been fulfilled. To move this container. What's inside the container? Who can say? All you know is, it's special. Well, what happens if I press a ret? The crane does not return to its original position. It does not move at all. Okay. Let's see if we can look at what's in here. Before you oh. stands a cargo container. Just one of many in the yard. Leave alone? Clyson means whale ford in Arden. Okay. Before you stands a cargo container. The container door appears unmoved by your attempt at flattery. A tough nut to crack for sure, but the strongest containers often have the softest hearts. You're a fine piece of engineering, you know that? The door does not respond to your advances. Is it possible that it seems somehow more closed than before? Why does this situation feel so familiar? Do you have a history of propositioning inanimate objects? Open, knock on the door? No reply. 
The knot produces a hollow ring of metal. Doesn't sound like there's anything inside the container. Open the door? You attempt to turn the handle, to no avail. The doors seem to be mechanically locked. Okay, I don't think we can open the door right now. I forgot to go, um, use logic on this gentleman over here. I forgot all about it. So, we got the container down. Don't know what we're gonna do with it. Oh, hey, mister. I knew you'd be back to talk with old Leo here. Yes, I did. Yes, I did. It's like Lady Larice said when she opened a bathhouse in the basement of my apartment building. They can only get so far before they're aching to get back. And lots of folk really did keep coming back. Can we keep this greeting shorter in the future? Sure, mister. Absolutely. I'm always willing to help out nice fellows such as yourself. He smiles his, dishearten his disarming smile and looks you deep in the eyes. Okay, containers. Oh, I'm just making some covers for them containers here. Yes, I am. The containers in the yard are green in Wild Pine's livery, and the mountains rising behind Leo is all red in Union colors. It's like some red infection was spreading outwards from the container yard's core. There appear to be cisterns underneath the Union container covers. Looks like a massive redecorating option. Yes. Operation. Moving from inwards to outwards. By the looks of it, soon everything will be in Union colors. Has anyone told you why you need to change the covers? No, not really. Miss Everett doesn't tell me all the big things. Says I go and tell them to everyone. <laughs> he shrugs. <laughs> What's underneath the red covers? Oh, I don't know, mister. They say it's some chemicals. Most of them have labels on them, I think. Hmm. Thanks, Leo. You've been very helpful. Oh, no trouble at all, mister. No trouble at all. Bye, Leo. <laughs> Some chemicals. <laughs> okay. So there might be something in that container, even though it sounds like there's nothing in it. But somehow we have to use rhetoric to get it open. Which is really freaking weird. Alright, we gotta go back up this way. Measure head's still there. There was something this way. empty bottles of Commodore Red and potent Pilsner. These three packs worth of cigarette butts. All those empty wine bottles and cigarette butts on the ground. Someone partied really, really hard here. How hard? Well, they went through six bottles of potent Pilsner, three bottles of Commodore Red, and almost four packs of cigarettes. It must have been pretty hard. Did I do this? Look at it. Of course it was you. You parted here. Jeez. Yeah, we did, Bratan. <laughs> and from the looks of it, we had a hell of a time. Hell of a time, Bratan. This is really sad. I must have been miserable. No, no, Bratan. I'm sure it was a blast. When do you and I not have fun together? Don't answer that. Just take that positive feeling and run along. Let's, um, oops. Well, sure. I didn't mean to press that button. Where's my bags? I got a skill point, right? All right, let's clean up some of our mess. What's this? This is the night watchman's booth. The name on the door reads, Rene Arnaud. Maybe Renee's hiding something interesting? Search the booth? Nothing incriminating catches your eye. The cabinets are clean and their sparse contents meticulously organized. There's a framed photograph on the table. Can I look at the picture? Let me take it. It's a black and white photo of a young couple out in a street fair. The man, Rene, is dressed in a Royal Carabinier uniform. The girl is young and very pretty. She is smiling playfully at the camera. Rene looks like he's about to smile. This photo must be tied to some good memories. Mm -hmm. Why did I take it? 
Aww. And now I'm just gonna sell it. Revishall Fair, Summer of 91. What the heck else am I gonna do with it? I guess I can come back during the day when Renee is here and talk to him about it, maybe. Can I open this door? Whoa, where am I? <laughs> An imposing combination of a punch clock and a payphone is looking down at you from the wall. A note on the side says, Tokens unavailable due to strike. Use change. Okay. The machine swallows your coin and seems to be waiting for your next move. Let your muscle memory dial a random number. If I leave, do I have to put money in it again? Oh, it's God. unclear whether you actually have muscle memory. Right now, your finger is just drawing vaguely occult patterns in the air. I might try again later. Useful patterns? Undoubtedly, no. no. <laughs> I'll try again later. Sure, why not? Muscle memory is a tricky thing. Nothing tricky about that. You just do, fail, repeat, until it works. All it takes is motivation and practice. Hmm. Radio is emanating a strange buzzing sound. Giant aspirin on the pillow and a pattern of coffee rings on the armrest. So I'm going to have to... The already familiar cold touch of plastic welcomes interfacing. you. Interfacing. I got a point, didn't I? Oh wait, I have clothes too, don't I? I'm going to have to put another one in there anyway because I can't try it again. Now I can though. What's this? What is that? A book. Okay. La Fume. The already familiar cold touch of plastic welcomes you as you your fingers run <gasps> over the dial pad. Zero zero five. That's the dialing code for Revishol. Four nine five two and a moment of hesitation before entering the final numbers. Nine, nine, three. Calling. Calling. Still calling. Then. Video Ravishal, 24 hour video rental. We rent eight and 10 millimeter film for home use. This is Lamy, how may I help you? The voice of a youngster on the other end sounds as enthusiastic as that of a man walking towards the gallows. What is this place? Video Revershall is a 24 hour video rental. We rent 8 and 10 millimeter film for home use. This is Lummy. Uh, no, I mean, what is this place to me? Sir, I don't know. It's a video rental. Maybe you rent videos here. Do you know me? No. <laughs> Why did I call you? Maybe you called to extend your rental period? Do you need to extend your rental period? Maybe, but I don't even know my name. If you need any further assistance, you can visit us on the corner of Voyager Main. I can't help you over the phone. Are we done? He sounds annoyed now. He thinks you're pulling a prank on him. On the corner of Voyager and Main, a large neon sign hangs on the side of a building. Video Revishol, 24 hours. It's raining and there is almost no traffic on the street. A woman's footprints in the mud lead away from the front door. Tiny heels tiptoeing down the road. Beautiful steps light-footed with a lifetime ahead of them. You look up and the air seems to grow darker. Suddenly you feel like you don't want to hear about video rentals anymore. You don't want to hear about any of it. It was all shit. It's over. What was all shit? It. Okay, uh, we're done. Hang up the phone. Hmm. Every worker member of the board <laughs> written top of flyers. In the bottom, the union logo demand democracy. This is a Dewey typewriter. The model name is on the back. Standard office file cabinet. The drawers seem to be locked. Someone left the coffee machine on. Dark liquid in the pot looks almost sentient. 
On second glance, someone has forgotten to properly close one of the drawers. Open it. The drawer opens smoothly. Inside is a well-organized selection of brown folders. Browse through the folders. Hundreds of documents containing logistical data. Two kinds of transactions stand out. Materials coming into Revachol from the outside world, from Muindi, Grad, and even Ilmara, and the same materials being handed over to companies inside Revachol, Kuron, Coal City, La Delta, and Jamrock are listed among the many districts where the imports are being sold. Anything interesting? It's hard to make sense of this thicket of company names, dates, quantities, and percentages. You try to focus, but the lines are getting blurry. All right, close the drawer. The drawer slides shut smoothly. I will see if there's anything that'll help me with volition. Doesn't look like it. Anything in my thoughts hurting volition? Okay. Save. The file cabinet stands steady as ever. And the look how blurry nope. all the lines on these papers are. How unwieldy your own willpower is to yourself. You're like an absurdist Samaran monk, focusing through not focusing. Hermeneutics was almost within your grasp, but now only vague letters float before your eyes. Less meaningful, but aesthetically more pleasing. Could I actually focus through not focusing? You are a police officer, not a spiritual healer. You can focus the normal way by turning your attention to something and not letting go. Leave the folders alone for now. Oh, you're just going to let me do it again? Oh, volition through... <laughs> volition thought focusing. All right. You're trying <sighs> hard, but the data here is unbelievably dry. Something about containers. All right. The drawer slides shut smoothly. Try again. The file cabinet stands steady as ever, and the un whatever's hidden here is hidden well. Concentration isn't enough. Only a trained accountant with a background in logistics would be able to really make sense of it. However, there is a little handwritten note stuck on the side of the drawer. Look at the note. It appears to be a to-do list written in large, uneven capital letters. Remember, Leo, Everard's shoes, special whirling borscht, water Everard's plants, sweep office floor, more banners. All items on the list have been crossed out and the note itself is crumpled. It doesn't look too incriminating, but still feels like a find. Take another look at the note. Remember, Leo, Ever all items on the list okay. have been crossed out and the drawer slides shut smoothly. I thought we would take the note, but no. Maybe if I brought Kim with me, he would have some more insight or something. Because it, it's still like, interact with it. More books? No. More magnesium. I need that. Ooh, glasses. I lose a drama, but gain a visual calculus. So, these are giving me logic. And then I could put this drama shirt on to counteract that. I still might go punch Measurehead just for the heck of it. Let's make sure I can get back in this way. Yeah. So, I guess now that I have the card or something... I thought maybe it would say something about why I could get in, but that is not the case. I wonder if I can be a, a smartass about it and like talk to Measurehead and be like, I got in without you! Your race descent has only worsened no. since I last saw you. Won't let me punch him. Okay. Let's see, what's on our task list? Pick up the dice from the dice maker, that's later. Close, that's later. Run the number on the victim's armor. Oh, call Alice back. 
We forgot to do that, I think. Or am I supposed to do that tomorrow? Gosh, I can't remember when I did things. Explore the whirling secret passages, buy the flan pants from Kuno. Do we have the money to do that? We do, let's go do that. Fuck, does Kuno care? I want your pants. Here, pig. We've fallen now. Performance buddies. Kuno unzips his jacket again and pulls the pants out of the plastic wrapping. Kuno could already see you soaring through the air like a fucking eagle. <laughs> Pig's in Kuno's debt now. Money debt. He looks at you with pride. Kuno doesn't fucking care. Bye. <laughs> Minus one suggestion for unsavory odor. But it boosts Savai Flare. And what am I wearing right now? Composure. Oh, what did I... Oh, I was reading this. Okay, this is plus one Savai Fire and plus one physical instrument. Yeah, let's put those on. Entry level flan modular track pants. Meant to get the urban athletics started down the flan path. Labels say hydrophobic 100% blah blah blah. Pseudoscientific mystery around these pants. They feel rubbery and futuristic to the touch. Plus one physical instrument. Save flare spacious crotch. <laughs> Alright. I was told those were the best pants in the game. Now I see why. Alright. What else we gotta do? Sing karaoke. Who made the call? Track down your badge. Track down your gun. Keep looking. It's unclear how we go about finding karaoke, who made the call, explore whirling secret passage. And I think I gotta call her back tomorrow. Victims tattoos. Ask another about the tattoos possible meaning. So who else do I ask about the tattoos? Interview the union boss. Send the victim's body to processing. We got the boots. Wash the boots in a kitchen? Excuse me? Why? <laughs> Why does my bathtub not work? <sighs> Find the cryptologist, close the water lock, the smoker on the balcony, ask around for his apartment number. That's right, we gotta be awake. Port back to- alright, she's asleep. Find the murder weapon. Find the working class husband. Pick up dice from the dice, speak to the assault victim. Okay. Find smokes and smoke them. All right. So let's try the only kitchen we know. I don't understand. Should I go bug Gart about them? Um. Ooh, can I use this? Am I boiling them? This industrial gas-powered stove has been used to prepare food for many hungry hostel guests. There are several pots and pans on hand. It's gonna be really gross. Check out the cookware. A commercial pot draws your attention. It's very large, gigantic even. It could be used to make enough stew to feed an entire city and also to boil a putrid pair of death boots. This is really sanitary. Far away, in the darkness of a makeshift morgue, Behind Station 41's Lazarus, Dr. Nix Gottlieb cuts into the cold, dead feet of a murder victim. The veins are oddly black. He suspects a neurotoxin. Check out the cleaning supplies. There is a variety of soaps and bleaches in the cabinet to the left of the stove. There is also a bottle of white vinegar in the cabinet next to the fridge. Okay, I guess as long as we, you know, properly sterilize this. It's bad with those boots. Don't be stingy now. Soap. Pour lots of dish soap. It's really disgusting. Pour some dish so soap and the bottle of white vinegar. Well, dish soap and vinegar. I think it'll be okay. The delicious smells of cheap soap and vinegar waft up from the pot. All right now, chef. Light up the stove and boil them. Add water and the boots, bring it all to a nice boil. The strong smell of vinegar forces you to step away from the pot. The water slowly comes to a boil. Wait, 
Strips of polymer fabric and human tissue separate from the lining of the boots. They float to the bubbling surface. Gross. Wait some more. The boots look cleaner and cleaner. Those bits of human flesh are beginning to look cooked. You can smell it too. Mm -hmm. Just like beef stew. Great. Wait some more. That's it, chef. The boots are as clean as they're going to get. Steam dense with the smell of strange meat disappears into the vent above the stove. Dump the sock in flesh stew and examine your new boots. A pair of real beauties. The boots are shiny, hot, and reek of vinegar. Just perfect. Master Chef out. Can you clean the pot at least? <sighs> Can you? <laughs> Authority. But we lose a composure. They're too big. Screws are light as feathers and just a tad too big for you, but don't let that bother you. You look like some kind of future warrior and they'll keep you safe if you accidentally shoot yourself in the fight. <laughs> so worth it. We lose a composure. Okay. Doesn't one of these, doesn't one of these give us a composure? I guess not. I keep, I keep clicking on that. You look down at the white ceramic sabatons hugging your arches and calves. Surprised at how well they fit. Your movements cause tiny little clicks, like dice rolling somewhere far away, as the plates reorient to your motions. I'll be responsible with this. This is just to protect me from harm, not to show off. Decked out in future armor like a cop ought to be. The hardened, vitreous enamel, at once sleek and light, adds a glow to your cheeks and a spring to your step. Just imagine what a full suit of this stuff could do for you. Yeah, I want the full suit. It may be a while before you have all the pieces. In the meantime, you should analyze the armor. Figure out its vulnerabilities. Vulnerabilities? Remember, this is a highly specialized kinetic redistributor meant to stop bullets. Wear it. Observe its properties. See if there's a weakness in the design. For the day you have to fight someone covered in the same material. Okay. I think I'm out of space. But I have lots of thoughts now. Cool. So we have time. Now. Talk, um, I would like to go in here. I would like to read one of these. 16 days of coldest April. Cover features a row of concrete buildings with a monochrome rainbow in the sky. Tells a rather excruciating story about two lovers during a period of ethnic unrest. Book's been filled under psychological realism. Hmm. A, the leading intellectual organ of Martinez communism offers a radical Mazovian perspective on a range of contemporary issues. Cover features a stylized portrait of the late King Frizzell with a pair of white antlers growing out of its head. Oh, we need to read that. I wanted to read this Dick Mullen book. And we, I think we read this. Or maybe we can read more? Book of the Greatest Innocence. Handwritten note from the fridge. Alright, let's read this book. In your hand, you hold Dick Mullen and the mistaken identity. The brittle paperback feels fragile to the touch. Examine the cover. The cover features a pastiche of different scenes. In the foreground, a man in a dark overcoat clutches a pistol to his chest. Rising up behind him are two silhouettes wrapped in a passionate embrace. The tagline reads, Detective Dick Mullen must prove his innocence after an old friend is murdered by someone who looks just like Dick Mullen. That seems to sum up the premise nicely. Needless to say, it violates nearly every RCM regulation for a detective to investigate a murder in which he is a suspect. Start reading. The story opens with a knock at the door. Detective Dick Mullen is greeted by an old friend, Charlie Spillane, who's come to Mullen to ask a favor on this dark and cold night. Spillane needs Mullen to drive him in from Vespa to a small town along the Insulindian coast. Despite his friend's apparent agitation, Mullen does as he's asked, then returns home 
where he passes out drunk, as he does most nights. An extremely unprofessional and hurtful stereotype that's offensive to all upstanding officers of the law. Look, I can't judge. Two days later, Mullen is arrested by the Vesper police and charged with the murder of Charlie Spillane. At his interrogation, Mullen learns that Charlie Spillane was shot in a bar in the very town Mullen dropped him off in by a man matching Mullen's description. Desperate to clear his name, Mullen manages to convince the Vesper police to release him for three days so that Mullen may solve his friend's murder and prove his innocence. There's no way Mullen did it. Of course Mullen didn't do it. That's the whole premise of the book. Anyway, Mullen returns to the seaside bar where Spillane was murdered and meets a beautiful, mysterious woman named Diana Denerva. Nice dame. Now it's getting interesting. Keep reading. Deneuve reveals that she was Spillane's lover and that he was mixed up with a local amphetamine smuggling operation. As soon as Mullen begins pulling at strings, the whole conspiracy begins to unravel. Not only is the local police captain in on the amphetamine ring, so is the son of a powerful politician and a strung out art collector named Torvald, each of whom has his own reasons for wanting Spillane dead. Tell me about the corrupt police captain. Outwardly, the old police captain is a real law and order crypto-fascist, a barrel-chested man who's beaten his share of suspects to pulp. But he's also dirty and increasingly paranoid that someone's going to expose his role in the drug ring. He would certainly have the motive and the means, but the captain walks with a noticeable limp from an old war injury. Is it possible that he was able to conceal it long enough to commit the murder? Mm, I want to hear about the politician's son. A typical privileged twat. In all likelihood, he's just in over his head. He does bear a personal grudge against Belaine, though. A former prosecutor who nearly brought down his father's administration. Okay. The kid doesn't exactly have Dick Mullen's manly build. But he is the correct height, and while interrogating him at his home, Mullen did notice a certain overcoat that looks suspiciously like his own. Mm, what about the art collector? Torvald, the art collector, is a strung out mess. Frankly, it's hard to imagine him holding a pistol steady enough to actually hit someone, let alone plug them three times in the chest the way Ospelain got did. That said, Torvald and Spillane have a long history, and while interrogating him, Mullen discovers that Torvald was once involved with Diana Deneuve. Could it be that this is all over a sordid love triangle? All right, continue the story. One evening, Diana Deneuve comes to Mullen's hostel room in tears. The two of them drink half a bottle of vodka, and soon they're seeking comfort in each other's arms. Well, that testimony won't be admissible any longer. How does Mullen expect to solve the murder if he's sleeping with witnesses? The man's a prosecutor's nightmare. Solving a murder counts for nothing if all the evidence gets thrown out in court over police misconduct. That's just Dick Mullen's modus operandi. He might bend the rules, but he closes cases like no one else can. All right, get it, Mullen. As the two lovers share a post-coital cigarette, Diana Deneuve turns to Mullen and says, By the way, Dick, there was something else I meant to tell you. I love you. Whatever it is, Mullen never hears the words. A blow to the base of his skull knocks him out cold instantly. Damn it. When Mullen comes to, Deneuve is dead on the hostel bed next to him. To make matters worse, his clothes are covered with her blood. My God. Mullen trashes his blood-stained clothes and flees the hostel, knowing it's only a matter of hours before the cops discover Deneuve's body, if they haven't been tipped off already. Fleeing a crime scene, destroying evidence, even if Detective Mullen didn't commit the murder, he should be facing years behind bars. Dick Mullen won't be sent to the clink for the sake of some legal niceties. <laughs> the heat is on. If Dick Mullen can't solve both murders before the cops catch up to him, he's going away for life. Can you solve the case before the cops close in? Hold on, I have some questions first. What is it, Detective? 
Why does everyone close to Dick Mullen wind up dead? It's a dangerous line of work, but somebody has to do it. That's why Dick Mullen never lets anyone get too close. Why did Dick Mullen become a detective in the first place? There was never a time when he wasn't a detective. He was born a detective. Was I not born to be a detective? For a moment, you cease to read the story on the page and see the book for what it is. A collection of brittle, cheaply printed pages held together by glue made from the hooves of horses. From nowhere, you hear the screech of sneakers on a waxed floor, and you feel the burn of rope against your hands. Are these figments of some other life? You won't find the answers you're looking for here, in other words. Why bother solving crimes when the world is so evil? Is it really so evil, detective? Yeah. Then, why are you still here? Because I need to solve this case. <laughs> Not for anyone else's sake, but for me. What are you trying to prove exactly? And what will change if you do manage to prove it? But then, what does this book know? It's just a poorly made piece of pulp garbage made to be consumed and discarded. That's not a nice way to treat books. I don't have any more questions. I figured it out. So, who did it, Detective? Communism. Who Charlie Spillane <laughs> and Deanna Deneuve? Love did the men, the dirty police caption, captain, the junkie art collector, the politician's twat son, Dick Mullen? I don't even know. I don't even care. I'm going to say the politician's son? Could be. Who knows? Only one way to find out. Finish the book. You begin furiously flipping through pages. Even as you know these books follow a series of well-worn tropes, you find yourself completely engrossed. You're turning pages so fast, you don't even notice the ancient spine coming unglued. Aww. You try to grab the pages as they come loose, but your fingers aren't quick enough. They're gone. But the book shouldn't be that old. Dozens of pages scatter across the floor. The last fifth or so of the book seems to have been lost. It's possible that you could gather and reassemble the pages, but it would take way too long. No, it wouldn't. The pages have numbers on them. Now I'll never know. That's right. You never will. But then, isn't that how it is in real life, Detective? I can just go online and look up the ending on Wikipedia. Last year, more than 71% of murders in Revachol went unsolved. In Revachol West, that number was closer to 85%. In your hand, you hold four-fifths of Dick Mullen and the mistaken identity. Put the book away. So, reading books is supposed to pass time, from what I had heard, and no time has passed since we've looked at these. Let's read... I, I have heard, like, you can get thoughts from reading stuff, or you can have conversations with people about the books later, so I do... I think these are all useful and interesting. I don't know. Let's read The Greatest Innocence. The Greatest Innocence by Joao Paulo Salomão Lopez de Fuego. The book is large and heavy. Crack it open. Browsing through the various chapters, you try your best to understand the ceaseless overflow, the sprawl of names, dates, places, events historical. Most of it ends up as a twisted mass of facts inside your brain. Your educational survey is done. Did you catch any of that? No. Oh well, it's pop quiz time. Let's see what you've learned. This might take a few minutes. Oh God. You ready? Sure, why not? That's the spirit. Here we go. Question one. Who was the first innocence? Oh yeah, this is what I was made for. All right, give me all the hints you got. She was talking, no, it wasn't Dolores Day. Give me the hints. A pop quiz is a short examination designed to test your knowledge without any prior warning or announcement. Such exams allow the teacher to assess how thoroughly the students have retained the material at hand. Voila. Now blast that first innocence. Thanks for nothing. <laughs> Dolores Day. Thank you. Dolores. Thank you, thank you. Incorrect. Ah. Dolores Day was the innocence of humanism, internationalism, 
and the welfare state. She codified parliamentary democracy and created modern institutions. Among these, the moral intern, she was powerful and beautiful on all her icons. So who was the first innocence? Her colors are silver, white, and apricot. And when you think her name, Dolores, stomach acid rises to the back of your throat oh. and it hurts. You see a flash silver, a wreath, an airport bag, and blonde hair. You don't know why. Another choice, perhaps? Hmm. Stay clear of this one. There's something terrible about this one. No, what? A strange oh, sensation gosh. of loss. When she left the earth, the dust, and the ice, and the humans. That is unimportant to the quiz. Stop thinking about this. But I want to know about it. Yes, the quiz is impersonal. No need to rouse sensations in yourself at the mention of Dolores Day. Who was the first innocence? It wasn't Dolores Day. The heck is Sola? Is it this one? What's Sola? Incorrect. Yeah. Sola was anointed during the previous century and even lived to see the current one. She was an urban planner who spoke her mind and largely left history to its own devices, encouraging people to excel on their own rather than prescribing to a deified model of history. She is often called an anti-innocence. Hmm. Sola resigned after an assassination attempt by a Yugo nationalist who blamed her for not taking the side of the left during the turn of the century revolutions. Innocences don't usually resign. Care to try again? I'm pretty sure this one's wrong too. Correct. Oh! Nothing much is known about him. It's not even clear that he was a he, but Franco Negro presumed as such and called him Pius. He's depicted as a young man with molten gold pouring out of his mouth. All he spoke was gold. It said he invented God and equality of men before God. He also introduced the gold standard as a way for measuring people's love for Aram. For Aram? As the first innocence, he declared that there should be more of those like him. It is presumed his disciples were the beginning of the Holy Party, the Founding Party. Question two, who was the strongest innocence? Oh my God. Easy, everybody knows the answer to this. You, me, anybody. All right, sure, I'm sure you've got my back. An innocence is the highest category of historical personage in the world, a literal personification of history. Traditionally, an innocence, when anointed, assumes supreme rule over the Occident or the known world in general. At least, the parts that matter. Yeah, but I thought you'd give me the answer to the question. Hmm, I can do better. <laughs> okay, so commonly, an innocence does not enforce his or her power through military power. This is seen as unnecessary. The innocence wins because an innocence can't help but win. For their deeds are inevitabilities. Did this help? No. Damn. <laughs> Good Dolores. It's not Dolores. Let me hit Dolores again. Let me let's continue down this thought. Incorrect again. While she originated many modern institutions, launched several successful expeditions, and was even critical of the innocentic system itself, and somehow keeps popping up in your mind, she is not often considered the strongest. Even though the words most associated with her rule are l'amour, la compassion, la autodiscipline, love, compassion, self-control, which could be seen as facets of strength. Would you like to try again? Mm-hmm. Please, relax. All right, so he said, I'm thinking... One of these guys, he's saying it doesn't come from a military strength. And I think one of these guys had to do with the revolution. So I think this one's probably wrong. I'm going to pick it. Incorrect. Yes. Vespa Messina is not a person. Really? But a defunct state on the southeastern coast of the Occident. 
It used to take up most of the peninsula before separating into the republics of Vespa and Messina. Care to try again? Ah, for sure that was familiar to me, but all right. It's uh, Frank Negro, whose name we yelled out when we jumped that, um, jump to get our coat. Correct. Named the innocence of militarism, he codified hereditary rule, but at the same time ended serfdom and established the inter Isolari real as the global reserve currency. He also established the concept of the nation. Franco Negro attempted to solve the rising tensions between the aristocracy and bourgeoisie by building a unified society in which every man has a place and a mission, but at the same time may rise to nobility provided on the strength of his virtue. Question three, who was the false? Innocence got it under control. No problem. Solid on this one. It's widespread historical information. You gonna be helpful this time? Yes. There exists a group called the Founding Party, known as the Holy Party, during the time of the Periconarsian. This, the world's oldest international organization, spends its time in search of either the re-emergence of the Innocents or new members. Sigh heavily, out loud. There seems to be a mix-up with the sources. It's not my fault. <laughs> At least it clearly wasn't Dolores Day. She wouldn't be false. She's beautiful. Of course she's false. Let's click on it. No, stop thinking it. <laughs> I said it wasn't her. She was true. All right, what about Stefan the Despicable? Incorrect. Stepan the Despicable, Regent of Kedra, was a ruler who conquered the known world during the Kedriatic Conquest instead of the despotic Erno Pasternak. Would you try again? So apparently Kedra's a place, so it's it's Erno Pasternak? Correct. There have been a number of counter or false innocences, some assumed to have innocentic qualities, some who just thought so themselves. Occasionally, they have the support of a faction inside the ecclesiastic organization and accusations of foul play have arisen. The most famous and important of these was Erdenau Pasternak. He was into torture, despotism, hymns, cannons, and world conquest, but got defeated and humiliated by Stepan the Despicable of Kedra. Final stretch, you've come so far and learned so much. This is the most important one. Question four, who was the greatest innocence? The most important of them all, the most precious to humankind. Dolores. I've got it, honest. Mm-hmm, okay, I'll bite. Of course, this is my thing, the reason I exist in this world. The correct answer is Franco Negro. You're absolutely certain? Zero doubts. I'm not sure. It's Dolores. Correct. <laughs> the Mesk might see Franco Negro as the father of nations, but as of this century, there's been a great shift in attitude. Dolores Day has become widely regarded as the greatest innocence, a most radical change to the whole fabric of the world. Everything from inter isolary travel to the connected world to three consecutive scientific revolutions can be traced back to her. Every decade that passes, she seems less human somehow and more beautiful. Congratulations on finishing the test. The results and your subsequent grade have been calculated. Oh no. You get. Oh, oh no. An F for failure. <laughs> Thanks. You would have done better if you'd just left Dolores Day for the end. Dial the Dolores Day down a bit. Damn you, you put the you book are away. at an inanimate object, like a real weirdo. No wonder you seem to have trouble with the right answers. Man, something's weird about this book. You should do something fun instead. Rock out. Forget about it. <laughs>